bowling pins were my indirectly my inspiration for doing spiral work. My grandfather was a pattern maker in Duluth, Superior, Wisconsin. He died a few months before I was born, and he made a pair of candlesticks out of bowling pins that sat on my grandmother's mantle. And ever since I was a little kid, I wanted those candlesticks. In the end, I never got them. One of my aunts did, but uh, thanks to somebody here, I have two bowling pins tonight, so I can make them my own. <laughs> but that was actually my inspiration for making uh, spirals many years ago from uh, my grandfather, who I never met. My first episode with spirals and twists was this, which is a little bit crude. My candle is broken, but hey, it's Halloween. It makes it spookier. <laughs> uh, very basic. Designs, nothing to write a home about. The quality of work's not so hot, but... That was my first one. Made that in 1970. My uh, wife was helping me. I was making a set of these. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's bad. <laughs> I was making a set with a slightly different design. And I was going to have a uh, metal cup on the top, you know, do this all right and sand it and make it all beautiful. Uh, I was at work. My wife. I made up six of these, I think. I hadn't, I hadn't tackled the ones like my grandfather's yet. But uh, she was going to help me. So she was sanding on them while I was at work that day. She called up, caught, got my boss on the phone. He had to leave the phone. He said, you know, if you got to go, you got to go. It's okay. It's all right. You can take off. But what had happened is my wife called. She was in tears. She had modified this. To that. <laughs> but the fact is, we love these and, and use them regularly. <laughs> so you, you just never know. Frankly, I, I think that would have not been anywhere near as attractive as we ended up. But I keep this one around to remind me of that little venture and detour and how a little serendipity uh, can. It's always around the corner. You never know. So when you make a mistake and screw something up or somebody helps you, uh, you haven't got an inspiration at the moment, stick it on the shelf and come back. Because you never know what it will lead to. Nowadays, I do things like this. Can you hold it up? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple others here that I will dig out too. I also do a few other goblets with, with twists in oh as well. Now <laughs> well, these are here, I'll leave them out. But Harvey likes to make pieces like that, as I recall. And mostly what I want to do is just give you an overview of some of the traditional techniques and measurements for doing spiral work. And then, of course, times have changed, things change, people do things different now than they used to. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's still the same basic thing. It's still mostly carving. It's not turning. You can do spirals by machine. And you end up with uh, very nice, uniform, even spirals. They look great. I don't know if this one will stand, but that's also machine time. It's kind of, probably just pass that one around. Or any of them if you want. But, and the machine can do a nice job. But there's things it can't do. For instance, that. Machine can't do that, except for a CNC. This was, a, a, was going to be a finial or something. Okay. Send that around. If you look at that, and actually, uh, where'd it go? I'll get to it in a minute, but the spiral on that, and on this one you can see it, if you actually measure the layout marks on here, they taper. Each one gets wider as you go up, or 
smaller as you go down. If you want, you can check them with this. You'll understand in a minute. I'll explain more about that. But uh, the machines can't do that. CNC can do that, but most of the machines that do spirals strictly do a straight, basically a machine thread, which is the same pitch all the way. And it doesn't look good. You know, if you don't have the proper change of pitch when you're doing things like that, and I'm sure you've all seen you know, a lot of the, the finial that you see quite often. I think Stuart Mortimer is probably best known for it. That, that pitch changes as it goes down to the tip, and it would look really ugly if it didn't. So I'll, I'll explain to you how that's done, how it's traditionally done, uh, the way the old timer used to do it, and it still holds true. Um, we also have very traditional furniture work. I'm moving these here because I don't want to fall on there. <laughs> Stuart Mortimer is going to be a feature demonstrator at the symposium. Is he? Oh, good. I haven't seen Stuart in a long time. Since, since you mentioned Stuart, Stuart and I are old friends. That's a pair of Stuart Mortimer goblets. And Stuart is very adamant about the fact that when you make a pair of goblets, you have to have a right and a left. Other than the fact that you got to clamp things down tightly. <laughs> Oh, Y'all know how to see the ground yet? Okay. Good enough. Since we're not really worried about precision here. <laughs> The jaws in your chuck yeah. are laid out as four. So I'm just going to take a pencil and mark it right here and go down. Your tool wrist makes a nice straight edge. So there's one. There's two. There's, whoops, there's three. And there's four. So I've got four vertical lines, horizontal now, but ultimately vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not very smooth. I don't care right now. We're not trying to make a piece. Just trying to give you the techniques and the information. Nothing I hate worse than a demo where somebody makes shavings for an hour and a half and talks for ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't like to do that. Okay. Now, if we decide to make this a four bind, we've got our four spots. We can make this more easily defined by dividing each of these in half. So I'll just eyeball it. You don't have to have perfection here. I'll mark the middle of that, the middle of that, the middle of that, and the middle of that. So now I've marked the four middles, and for the sake of clarity, get a different color. In this case, I've gone pencil and ink, which may work, and it does, but it's nice to have some colored pens or pencils around. You can make every other one here now is purple. Okay, so now I have my four main and my four in between. That just, just gives me more clarity. The next step is, was, yeah, calipers or dividers, either way. The next step, traditional and probably the English are best known for it, but the traditional way of making spirals was to have the spacing the same as the diameter. So we start off here, we measure the diameter, we lay this out, there's one. And again, high accuracy is not my priority right now, but uh, you can get it very accurate, very careful. Remember, you're carving. It's not going to be perfect unless you carve it perfect. So making this layout real close but not perfect is okay because everything is going to be a little different by the time you're done carving everything and sanding everything. It, unless you really work hard at it, it won't be perfect. And frankly, if I look at these, 
That one's perfect. That one's not. I'll leave it to you to decide. I, I just, the machine looks like machine. The hand done one looks like hand done. Now again, for convenience, putting dividers in between these gives me a, a finer grid. And we'll get another color out here. Brown is not a good choice. <laughs> okay. So again, I can just eyeball in between here and mark the middle of each of these. Okay. So we'll go around here and mark our grid here. Okay. And then we go around and mark the other one. <coughs> and the other one. And for the sake of the back row, pass that around. Okay? Now, once you got this laid out, you mark out the high and the low for your spiral. In this case, what have we got? We got three. Well, I'm doing two or four. Take your pick. But you, you can see this one has a grid marked on it. Who did this one? I didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> that might be Alan Batty. I'm not sure. But anyways, somebody, some Englishman did that. I don't remember which one. It wasn't Barry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What you do is you start off here, purple line. So that's going to be the beginning of my spiral. And I'm going to go diagonal across here. Hang on a second. To do that, right? Yeah. Well, because you've laid out this grid, yeah. what I've done now is I've made a single revolution from here to here. Right. And it's based on dividing this into quarters and dividing this by the diameter of the piece. Okay? That's the classic traditional furniture or stair pilasters or whatever. It's typically based on that ratio. Whether it's two bind, three bind, four bind, that just seems to be a pleasing spiral. This one, I didn't check this, but I'll, I'll lay odds that it's exactly the same angles based on exactly the same math. Uh, it, it's just the old traditional way of doing it. So then you just repeat this, and the piece going around has all these lines on it. As it turns out, it works just as well when you're doing these. Of course, my line's missing here. Just mark every one of them. Yeah. Okay? But that gets real confusing. Which one's which? Yeah. So back to, our, back to our colored pencils here. We'll make, oops, I did that wrong, didn't I? Mm -hmm. See, well, I was just checking to see if you're looking. <laughs> Here's blue, there we go. So, we'll make that one blue, and that one blue, and that one, and... The red one there needs to be blue, that last red one. This one should be blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this would continue down here, and up here. And up here. And again, I'm not worried about real high accuracy because I'm going to be carving this very brutally. Okay? It's not real finesse type work. So you go about and you lay that all out. And as I said, that's all laid out and done. The next thing you do, traditionally, and I say traditionally frequently because. Nowadays, we have power tools, and we do things different. But the classic traditional way was take a back saw, mark a depth. You take the back saw and mark your depth, and saw, saw down through the lathe and go home. <laughs> saw down through each diagonal to the depth of that mark. And I'm too lazy to do it right now, but that gives you a slot all the way to the bottom of the V. That would be basically you're sawing right there. Okay? Mm -hmm. This determines how deep you make this. And it, it's all variable. It's all up to you. It depends on whether you're doing a ribbon or a rope or a 
four by and a three by. Is that just on one color? Not yeah, you pick up, in this case, you, you, I'm using blue is the bottom of my groove. So on the blue ones, I saw. Then I go over and on the other blue one, I saw. And on the other blue one, oops, I try and saw. Okay? The black one, don't do it. That's the top. Okay? So the black one is this ridge. And that's how you lay out and get your high and your low point. The next thing you do is get mean and nasty. Where is, ah, there it is, that, and that. Oh. <laughs> that's right. Wow. Okay? Then you take a chisel and you chisel this out. Okay? And it helps if your lathe cooperates. Mm -hmm. Now realize when you chisel this, you gotta chisel it with the grain. So on this side, I have to chisel this direction. <laughs> Am I riding it? No, I'm beating it. Beating it up good. Yeah, you just uh, just like any other wood carving. Where's Grant? He'll he'll verify that. He probably doesn't use a big hammer though. But you just chisel it out, and in theory, you end up with he's chiseled out like that. Okay. After you chisel it, and we'll come back to this. After you chisel it out, you get out wood rasp, files, whatever you need, and you start piling. And if they're small, you get a small pile. And you start making this smoother and smoother. Eventually, you get the sandpaper, wrap it around a dowel. If you don't have a dowel, just wrap it around a tool. Surprisingly enough, that works just fine. You can wrap it around the tool, different diameter tools, and you end up with that. Now that one, I, you'll notice, has a knot hole in there. You can work your way around a knot hole sometimes, oftentimes. So I made, I made that one line up on the hole, so my hole, the knot, is right in the bottom of the groove. If I'm lucky, it doesn't go in too far. If I'm not, there's still a solution. Mm -hmm. There is an alternative. Instead of doing it this way, with the hammer and the chisel and the saw, we can get a little bit different and do open spirals. So far, we're doing closed ones. So if the knot goes through, I'll make my spiral go through. Mm -hmm. And the traditional way for that would be a drill. <laughs> And a drill bit, if I have one. I have one. I do. Really? Somewhere. Ah, here's a small one. Or a big one. Take your pick. Take a drill. And again, my blue line, only this time, I'm going to drill it. now is approximately halfway. And when I get done going approximately halfway, I'll go around. Well, maybe I'll go around. <laughs> that was the one. I didn't mark this one, did I? That's okay. We're working on that one. Be this one right here. So we'll work on the same place on the opposite side, I hope. Okay, so I've drilled a series of holes here, and you probably want them close and precise, nice and neat and tidy, but if you're just doing a quick demo, you don't waste time on that. And then you go from the other side. Ah. 
Okay? The reason I didn't go straight through, because I'm just eyeballing this. And I might be this way. So if I go in halfway, a little bit off here isn't going to hurt much. If I go straight through, I could come out way off in the wrong spot. So if I go in through halfway first, you find that I found that one and it lines up pretty good. And then of course you can go through sideways here and abuse your drill. And do the same over here. And of course the more careful you are, the less this you get, the less problems you get, and the less sanding and stuff you have to do. You can see very quickly, you get a hole through there, and you end up with something like that, which turns into that. <laughs> then you get out the chisel, do the same thing, chisel these bevels, sand them, if you get aggressive, you're going to do that to it, so don't do that. If you go the wrong way, if you try and chisel this the wrong direction, as you all know, you got to chisel these downhill on the grain. If you go uphill, you get chunks coming out, you glue them in, it never looks quite right. Actually, you get away with it sometimes, <laughs> but not usually. Bad idea. So pass this one around. So that's how you end up getting open spirals. And again, two, three, four, you just divide it into two or three or four. Always use the diameter for the, the thread pitch. The distance, this, this is a thread, it's a machine thread. The distance it travels longitudinally is called the pitch. In this case, it has one revolution around, goes roughly six inches, so I have a, a six pitch thread. And that's based on the diameter. This one has a different pitch thread, but still it's proportional to the diameter. Now, uh, if you want to get really aggressive, really have fun, you can always get out a power tool. And this works just fine. I'm not going to do it right now. Well, I can if you want. But uh, I use this frequently, even on exotic woods. Hmm. They're, they're basically you're using a chainsaw. Hmm. And don't ever think this is anything less hazardous than a chainsaw, because it isn't. Probably more hazardous, because it's small. It will come after you, it will bite you, and it will win. So be careful, light touch, keep it kind of away from you, don't stick your nose down there, and. Stick your nose to the grindstone, or you uh, <laughs> you regret it. Um, do you mind showing me how you do that? Actually, like, no. Do you, you want me to hold one hand? No problem. Made up on my life insurance. Are you? Oh, I don't know. I saw you running earlier tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Nine lives cat. Can you rescue? The pain I don't like. Okay. It's a tool rescue. Yeah, that's always the uh, important factor. Move the tool rest out. But you can just take this groove I started in drilling here. This is all backwards, but that's okay. around the edges with it and again always make sure you're cutting with grain so you're trying to cut on this side this way turn around stand on the other side and go the other way on the other side uh, light cuts it's not hard to control I think um, it's very intimidating makes lots of noise 
and is very hazardous, but it's not hard to keep keep in charge and make sure you're the boss. But it does have enough torque. If it binds in here, you get it twisted or crooked, it will uh, let you know that you really only think you're the boss. Because <laughs> it's got enough power to do whatever it wants. But that's very effective, very quick, especially on hardwoods. I mean, this is just cherry. I, I grabbed some cherry because it's soft, it's easy to work, it's fast. If this was hard maple or ebony or rosewood or something, uh, I'd still be working on the first part probably. And of course, the sanding gets very tedious. There's ways to solve that. You can use a, use a sanding disc, plain old sanding disc. It will get down in there. You can go along and sand on the two sides, no problem. I don't know if, how many of you have found these things yet. I've seen it. Oh, yeah. You ever played with these? They work. They really work. They come with a few grits. Harbor Freight's probably the cheapest. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I like them, and they do things that other things won't do. Flat wheels work very well. I'm sure you're all familiar with those. But, uh, it's basically a case of whatever, whatever works. The traditional way is nice, and it's good to know that. But it's also good to know how to speed things up. Yeah. Oh, here's another machine made. Didn't see that hiding down there. Now, I said I'd get back to the other thing earlier. What about a taper? The taper is the same exact process, except, except, anybody want to look at that? Probably not, you got the other one. To do the taper, is that a thicker piece here? To do it, but it's longer. Well, I'm going to cheat. We're going to cheat and jump right to the... Instead of making shavings, I'm going to show you the process on one that's already done. <coughs> Come on. Now, same exact process. This one's a taper. How do you do a taper? You do the same thing in the beginning. You set your tool rest here. You draw your four lines or three lines, six lines. But this time, you follow the exact same rule. Come down here. Oh, why would I do that? Measure the diameter and the distance. There it is. Now, measure the diameter here. Imagine that. Measure the diameter here. And so on and so on. That all makes sense? Any questions? Mm -hmm. That's great. Oh, come on, I'm not that good. Yeah, you really no, played it well. Okay. Start the smaller end and, and carry that. So each, each measurement is on the previous one. So I start at the end, marked it. When I got to this one, I measured this one. I marked it over to the next one, which is here. And then I'll set this on that one and open it up. So it clears that, set it up there, yeah. and do the next one. Excellent. Now that's, again, the classic English traditional way of getting the proper twist, changing pitch, to go with a taper and match a taper. And that's the thing that the machine can't do. Yeah. CNC, sure. Yeah. But uh, machines can't cut that without computers. When you get down here in this part, you have options here. I mean, if this was a finial or something, you'd bring this back in, taper it back down. You may choose to just freehand the taper back down because it's probably going to be more abrupt. And so this step procedure, it works within limits. But it's a very good guide to get things started. Some people, very artistic, and they could just look at that and say, oh, let's just draw it. Some people in here want to know the distance of tenths of an inch. Um, and everybody, everything in between, of course. 
But freehand is fine. It works just great. Using the calipers, setting this up, is a guide and a way to get something that's consistent, it's accurate, it's backwards. 